Good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, this episode, if you like, of the British Rowing Lockdown webinars sponsored by SAS. Just seeing a couple of people dropping on and back off, so I'll just give it a second. But just to um, reinforce that this um, webinar is being recorded, um, the slides and the recording will be available after the end of the webinar. You will have the opportunity to log any questions that you may have during the webinar using the chat function. So for those of you that have already attended some of our webinars, this will be familiar with yourselves. Um, so on your webinar panel, on the right hand side of your screen, you should be able to scroll down to the bottom and see chat function. This is where you can log any questions during the webinar. We'll collate those and um, hopefully have some time towards the end to answer any of those questions. And any questions that we do not have the opportunity to answer, we'll put together a question and answer sheet that will go out with the slides and the recording of this webinar. Tonight I'm being joined by a number of our Level 4 coaches, uh, Hannah Vines, Tim Morris and Sarah Harris, and at um, points through the presentation they'll be invited to speak to you all as well. Okay, so we'll, uh, we'll get started. I'm really um, pleased that so many of you have signed up to uh, join us this evening. Um, we're talking about a topic that um, I'm personally very passionate about, um, so it's really great that you are here to, uh, to join us and, and, and listen in. Currently in British Rowing, we are working to agree our own model of coaching excellence, which will run throughout our pathway from grassroots through to podium. One of the key factors that features in this is the importance of creating a high performing coaching environment. And I will stress that word performing, not performance. And we'll go on to look at why that's important in a moment. It's key that we ensure our athletes have the best environment possible to be the best that they can be. This of course is you know, multi-dimensional, but relies really heavily on you as the coach, understanding your coaching environment and your athletes, but importantly yourself and your own preferences in order to be able to create that, the desired environment. So what does my environment look like now? What is a high performing coaching? At the heart of coaching lies the idea of empowering people by facilitating self-directed learning, personal growth and improved performance. It's just one um, quote that I like um, that Jörg has kindly uh, shared with me. Those of you that joined Jörg's session earlier in the series uh, will know Jörg well through that. Our coach developer that works with our Great Britain rowing team. Sarah Harris and myself have been in lots of discussions with Jörg about what coaching excellence looks like and looking at that model that we're, we're adopting um, for British rowing across, across our pathway, as I alluded to earlier. And this is just one quote that um, Jörg has shared with me that I particularly like. So reflecting for a moment on your coaching context, if you had to explain your coaching environment to someone, how would you do this? Take a moment now, you don't need to share it with us obviously right now, but take a moment for yourself to reflect on you and your own coaching practice. What behaviours would people see being displayed if they walked into your environment? So if we had the luxury, it seems now, of actually being able to be on the water at this time, and uh, I walked along to your club and I came to watch you coaching, what behaviours would I see that you would be displaying if I walked into, into your club right now? 
On our advanced coach programme, we refer to coaching competencies and behaviours and anyone that's been through any formal education will be familiar with this terminology. And some of the behaviours that we, we look at are how you would be developing and running a programme, um, how you plan, implement and develop a training programme, what your coaching practice, training, training camp selection and competition um, skills and sort of behaviours are. But alongside that, there's some other key behaviours that we think are really important to creating that positive coaching environment and that high performing coaching environment. Another definition for coaching effectiveness and, and expertise or coaching excellence, if you like, comes from Cote and Gilbert, 2009. This model or theory looks at the consistent application of inter and intrapersonal knowledge and skills. And these are two more of the coaching behaviours or competencies that we look at to help coaches develop through elements of the Level 4 programme. Interpersonal skills refine the adaptation of coaching behaviours to manage and maintain effective relationships. And we would look to see motivational and leadership skills, ability to lead both athletes and coaches. And we we would hope that coaches would employ a variety of communication strategies and different learning and coaching methods that would be appropriate to their athletes at the level at which they're rowing. We would hope that you'd create an open coaching and learning environment by seeking input and feedback from all parties that were involved. And I particularly like this, this model as well. Um, it's something that is used on our programme um, and really it reinforces the fact that it's consistent application of, of all of these factors that help ensure that the athletes outcomes are, are key. So their competence, their confidence, their connection and character um, in whichever coaching context you may find yourselves in. So it, it shouldn't matter what level of athletes you're working with or what environment you're working within these are some key concepts and some key outcomes that we would hope uh, to see. I guess another way of looking at it when you look at this model is to think about what type of person you would want your athletes to look like away from your rowing club or away from your school or, or the environment within which, within which you're coaching. So when they step off the water and leave you, what do you hope that, you know, that what type of person would they present when they move away from, from, from the rowing club? How can you stimulate them? How can you influence this by how you behave as a coach? What practices or language can you adopt to ensure you reach out to your athletes? These are really important questions that maybe we don't have the time for when we're immersed in our training programmes. Maybe at this point in time, we might have a bit more time to think about this. These are some of the key concepts, again, that we, we look at on our Level 4 programme. Um, and we ask you to do a lot of reflection around this. And through my work on the programme, I've had the pleasure of observing a number of Level 4 coaches in lots of different environments and contexts. And the positive impacts that they have on their athletes. The consistent observations that I've been able to make when I've seen these coaches is the display of excellent interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. When I reflect back on these observations, I'm reminded of how enjoyable they were and how rewarding and inspiring the sessions were. And after one particular observation, I came off the water literally buzzing. And if that was how I felt from just observing the session, just imagine how those athletes were feeling. And I'm delighted now to be able to introduce that coach that I was observing to speak to you all briefly now. That coach is Hannah Vines, and I'll let her um, explain to you uh, where she's coaching and her coaching context, but um, just a little snippet to, 
to enlighten you about Hannah. She was once chased by a rhino in Nepal, and that's a true story. Um, and she's going to share some thoughts now on how she approaches her coaching. So Hannah, I will move on the slide and hopefully people will see you at too. Cool. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hopefully that sound has come through a OK. Um, yeah, choice of wonderful photos there of me uh, totally enjoying and immersed in what I am very lucky to do. Um, so what I wanted to kind of carry on from Loretta's input already is really how I've kind of um, been through the level four. I'm currently doing the optional third year as a master, so doing an independent project. And really just how the level four has, has helped me to formulate my reason why. I always thought I um, had a strong sense of purpose in terms of my coaching, but sitting in a room with other coaches and the theoretical elements that Loretta's just um, spoken about and being asked and kind of probed as to why, how do you do this, how do you know, has really helped me to focus and formulate a plan and a how I take what I believe in, which is using rowing as a force for good for young people. Um, and how do I actually make my environment do that? Um, so the one thing I would say with my reason why is, uh, and moving on to my how, is that this is a shared, shared why. This is a shared desire. It's certainly not mine. It may be driven by me, but it's it's not um, it's not my own. It's not my energy that has to bear the brunt of it. It's shared with my coaches. It's shared with my athletes. It's shared with my uh, my, my um, parents. And this isn't about being a, a slogan on a notice board or written in a newsletter or, a, you know, like a shield that you touch before you go on the pitch, for example. This is what you see. It's, it doesn't have to be written down. Um, so my co-workers at Dorney, for example, uh, Loretta alluded to, my behaviour represents my reason why. You, you wouldn't necessarily have to speak to me about what my reason why is. You would see it in the way I behave and interact with my athletes. Um, so a couple of uh, or a few hows I wanted to share with you about how to try and uh, develop a high performing environment. So I'm very much at the grassroots uh, element of the pathway. Um, and that's where we were quite key to say you could still be a very high performing coach in a high, uh, not necessarily in a high performance uh, with athletes, for example. And so one of the key things for me about how you develop that environment is actually listen to the language that you tell yourself. When I made a career change from being a teacher, that was all quite good when you're having conversations about what's your occupation. And I genuinely found my dialogue being, I'm just a coach, I'm just this. And through the level four and really kind of reflecting on my practice, you realize you have so much more power than just a coach. You really do change lives. And it was really starting to believe uh, what my role was into how I was going to make that high performing environment. Um, the key thing for me is my connection with my athletes. Um, so when I run a session, uh, I aim to speak to every single one of my athletes. And, he, and this is through kind of careful questioning. So it's not necessarily, are you all right? And you expect a yes or no answer. It's much more open ended. And you're trying to create that dialogue for them, uh, with them. For some of you with athletes in high performance, those conversations are quite deep and quite meaningful when you're talking about goals, targets, and particularly the connection is really being tested at this time when we're not seeing them face to face uh, in our own personal space, in our coaching environments. And this is a real test of how good that connection is. As Loretta mentioned, behavior is the key thing for me. And some of the self-talk that young people tell themselves about them not being good enough is really represented in their body language and the way they speak to each other. So it's a question of kind of scanning, listening to what's being said and trying to pick up on those things. Um, and the key thing for me is, is when you see a young person who, or any athlete who isn't necessarily behaving the way you would like, it's not about feedback, it's about feed forward. Because maybe they don't know what the appropriate uh, response or behavior should be. And it's sometimes all too easy for us as coaches to go, that is a negative, this is what you didn't do. And actually we need to feed them forwards and say, well, how about if this scenario comes about again, you could consider this action. And you can have a better 
conversation about changing those coaching behaviors and changing those behaviors to enable them to, to get better. Uh, at Dorney, although we are grassroots, we still do goals and targets as best practice. Uh, we want our athletes to have ownership about their development. And that kind of is, um, uh, lay, as a foundation, is laid on having information, okay? They need to understand where they are um, with their skills, uh, with their physical development, so they can actually set effective targets. And if they're not given that information, the whole process becomes a bit wishy-washy and they don't really know what they're meant to be doing. We, um, we delegate responsibility. As I said, I have overall responsibility for the outreach program at Dorney Lake. Um, I am the driving force. Um, ask anyone, they'll tell you. Um, but that responsibility is, 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 is picked up by my coaches and not by asking. Um, the whole feel of the environment, for example, the lesson that we deliver at nine o'clock on a Monday compared to the lesson at four o'clock on a Friday will be the same. The quality will be there because the people are amazing. And that whole environment, if I was off sick for one day, I have no question that the sessions would be amazing. They don't need me to deliver high quality coaching sessions. And I can, I can be late for work, I can have any of those things and they will all adapt. And it's that shared sense of why about how we deliver things. Um, Within our athletes, we have a junior captain and vice captain. And again, we, uh, when we bring new members into the club, we do a taster session. Then the kids will come along to a session. And at that stage, I kind of let go and I expect my junior vice captains and the youngsters to um, bring these new uh, members into the club. It's not my responsibility to handhold them. It's about these youngsters learning how to do those things for themselves. So there's an element of delegation and ownership throughout the environment. Um, in terms of training, we, we don't, I wouldn't say that we have a sense of training in its strictest sense, such as uh, you know, UT2 sessions for X amount of minutes. We see our athletes and the environment as problems. So we will create a, an environment of problems that have to be solved. Um, and that could be, you know, um, where we do skills and drills and things like that, we might use hoops, so they have to stand up in the boat, pass hoop over them, uh, and then they've got to literally hoop a duck. So we'll put a duck on the end of the pontoon that they then have to hoop, and we do team games. So it's very rare that we would do things as individuals. We do a lot of team interactions to help kind of their social skills and um, communication uh, with each other. Um, and what this does is creates quite this, this fun, but quite still intense sessions. Um, and there are some things where we've done exercises or we've done sessions where um, young people have no experience. So one example was we did uh, glow in the dark archery. Um, so soft play archery, strap glow sticks to the arrows, glow sticks for targets. And genuinely a 12 year old boy said to me, how do you hold this bow? because sometimes they're just not exposed to those things. So having quite a wide, wide variety of problems actually enhances their ability to learn. Um, one thing with the coaching team as well, um, from my point of view is we all have permission, particularly from me, to call each other out. Um, I'm very driven on where I want to go and I have blind spots. So it's, it's really clear that my coaches can say to me at any time, what about this? Did you think about that? Um, and can pull me up on my coaching behavior. So if I've got my phone out for far too long, I don't look like I'm engaged, call me out on it. And the same goes vice versa. It isn't a hierarchy, it's a team effort. Um, if my coach is all standing together, seen chatting, it's, it's kind of just hold the mirror up to yourself. What are you doing and what do you want your behaviors as athletes to be? Because if you're walking into a coaching session with a cup of tea before they're all about to sit on the ergo, what's that saying to them? That you're taking it too easy? get your biscuits out um, or are you actually engaged? So we need to consider our own coaching behaviors and give consent, I guess, to my athletes, to my coaches to call each other out. Um, the one thing I'd finish on is, is really that coaching is about coaching with care and edge. Nothing's gonna be perfect. Uh, we've had occasions when uh, we've had youngsters who kind of got onto a bit of a click and that we had say six weeks of class sessions planned out. We knew what we wanted to do and the behaviors started to deteriorate. Well, we just changed the session for six weeks. We were happy that um, 
we needed the behaviours over what the problems were, and we adapted and changed uh, to make sure that we tried to kind of nip that kind of catty behaviour in the bud, and also just pull kids up on it and say, what you're doing, why are you doing it, can you see the effect you're having on other people, because it could escalate. And lastly, to just echo uh, Loretta's message, it really is about consistency. As I say, nine o'clock on a Monday and four o'clock on a Friday, that quality and that consistency of, of what you're doing should be the same. Um, if a young person is not behaving the way you want to, the minute you let that slide, um, that's the minute they think, well, it doesn't make it, it does, it's not true. You're lying, essentially. So it's about consistency of message and of its implementation. And they're just my thoughts about how to create a high performing environment. I could go on for quite a long time. But like I say, anytime uh, anyone would like to come and watch Shadow, you're always welcome because I think that's how we learn best. Thank you very much, Ha. Um, I could listen to her talking all day, so hopefully uh, lots of you found that um, interesting um, as well. Um, and I can um, I can totally uh, uh, Hannah said about you know the session she has on a Monday morning would be the same as a session on a, a Friday afternoon. Um, the session that I observed, um, there was a teacher there, and uh, she actually turned around to me and said, "This is just the best time of our week." Um, because we know every week we're going to get Hannah and it's always the same Hannah um, and the kids absolutely love it and she didn't need to set, tell me that um, we were having just a, a conversation in, in general um, and you could see that with the joys on, on their faces as I said um, I came off the water buzzing and that is really a, a privilege that I have in working on the advanced coach level four program um, as I said I get to see um, all of the coaches in their environments uh, from um, GB coaches uh, down to obviously our very important sort of participation coaches as well. Um, the advanced coach is just one program that helps you take the time out to look at your yourself and your own coaching and explore a range of theoretical principles and academic research in order to help you underpin your coaching practice with sort of sound findings um, like the ones I you know briefly sort of uh, started to talk about at the, at the beginning um and i hope you would agree that it, it's not the people in the boat that make you a good coach but the tools you provide them with and how you empower them to be a better version of themselves that is what actually counts so whilst here we've got a lovely photo of one of our gb8s it it you don't have to be coaching high performance athletes to be a high performing coach and to create an environment of coaching excellence and of excellence in, in rowing. Um, in order to be involved in the advanced coach program, the level four program, you know, it's important that you're committed to encouraging or working within a high performing environment and have a desire to develop people. It's not about taking current knowledge to the next level but looking at how you can make better use of those tools that you have with your athletes. And maybe taking time to sort of ask that question again, what outside of sport or the training environment would you want your athletes um, to look like? What, what sort of people would you want them to be? And what tools do you have already at your disposal that you could maybe make better use of to have a greater impact? And as, as Hannah said, you know, feed forwards, um, not feed back necessarily. So I've talked about the advanced coach and the level four, and I just wanted to give you some information about how the programme is structured, should it be something that you would be interested in. So there are a number of ways that you can come on to the programme via our um, UKCC level three or other development programmes or qualifications. And that's very much seen on an individual basis. And the UKCC level four is made up of um, a couple of factors. So the governing body support programme, which in essence is the level four-ness and a postgraduate diploma. Um, you can then move on if you um, desire to an independent uh, study which makes up your diploma to a master's and Hannah will talk a bit more about that um, a little bit later. 
So postgraduate diploma is in professional coaching practice. And we run that in partnership with the University of Gloucester, and I'll come back to that in a second. The level fourness, as I as I call it, the level four part of the program, um, has a number of elements to it to provide you with the support to move your coaching forward. Um, one of those is 360 reviews. So we offer the coaches on the programme the opportunity to complete two 360s a year. <clears throat> it's a part-time programme which runs across two years. You can send out your 360 um, review to anyone that you work with. So that may be your athletes, it may be fellow coaches, it may be line managers, um, it may be other coaches that you, um, that you help mentor in, in other settings. And you send that out. Um, they can provide anonymous feedback if they wish, and they comment on the behaviours that, that that they see you display through your coaching practice. Um, and between yourselves and myself, we then sit down and look at the overall report from those 360 reviews and look at a way that we we could draw out um, conclusions, if you like, or key themes that I we then put together an action plan or areas that you might want to explore further and, and, and move on in, in your own development. Um, and this part of the programme is something through feedback from level four coaches that have been through the programme has been really beneficial um, for them. It runs alongside field-based visits, so by that we mean observations of, of coaching practice. Um, and those observations are really an opportunity for you as a coach um, to share any queries or questions, about your coaching, not necessarily the knowledge or the technical kind of know-how or content, but the how that Hannah was talking about um, and how you can get more out of your athletes. And it's really just another opportunity to have somebody else to come and, and see your coaching and give you some feedback because how often do you get feedback on you know your coaching? And again, this is seen as a really important part of the programme. You know, quite often we're quick to sort of judge our coaching um, expertise, if you like, on the outcome or the performance of our athletes, um, not necessarily on, on how well we feel we're coaching. Um, so again, it's, it's just a way to do that. Um, it provides you with, with mental support. So you have a mentor. Um, we ask you to look at um, somebody that you might like to have as a technical mentor. Um, but also myself as a programme manager um, acts as a mentor through the programme and supports you through the 360s and the observations. We ask you as well to keep a reflective log. Now everyone keeps these differently um, and it's just a way for you to take that opportunity, take that time out to hold that mirror up and, and uh, make some observations. And we then ask you to come to uh, present some of your key learnings um, to a panel, it says panel interview there, but it's really much more of a discussion. Um, and anyone of the level four coaches that's been through that um, always come away going, oh, that was, that was much more fun. It wasn't an interview at all. It was really nice just to talk about rowing and to talk about coaching. One of the key things as well that a lot of the coaches on the programme um, always say is really beneficial is the community of coaching practice that they um, create with the fellow coaches on the programme. And that's not just rowing coaches, but also equestrian. Um, and I'll come back to talk about some handouts a little bit later, but one of those handouts um, that's available to you um, through this webinar um, is some more um, level four coaches um, quotes on how, how they found the programme and also a little video from one of our level four coaches and the community of coaching practice was a really key element to that. Um, so, you know, quite often we know you get rowing coaches in a room, they'll talk about rowing. If you get coaches in a room from different sports, they'll talk about coaching. Um, and I know from the coaches that have been through the programme, they found that an extremely beneficial part. So, as I said, um, the Level 4 Advanced Coach programme is in partnership with University of Gloucester and they deliver the postgraduate diploma in professional practice in sports coaching. As I said, it's a part-time course that runs over two years. And whilst the lecturers are based at the University of Gloucester, 
the delivery isn't all at the University of Gloucester. So there is an induction that takes place at the university. Um, and then the different modules are delivered at different settings. So quite often we have modules delivered at Bisham Abbey and some are delivered at Stoney at the Equestrian Centre. Obviously at the moment during lockdown, um, the coaches on the programme have had to adapt and attend virtual uh, seminars and tutorials. Um, and there is discussion that potentially more of that can be embedded into the program moving forward for those coaches that can't attend those face-to-face -face days. Um, this picture here is of Paul Garner, who's the lead, um, the course leader for the program. He's the one in the white top. Um, and he delivers on transformational coaching on the program, um, which is just one concept that's discussed within the course, um, within the four modules that are coaching pedagogy, the expert coach, professional development and work based project. And then um, you can move on to do an independent project. The module descriptions for these are all in the handouts. Again, as I say, I'll, I'll come on to that uh, towards the end. Uh, so at this point, I thought it would be um, helpful to ask some of the level four uh, coaches that are on the programme at the moment to give you some first hand experience. So Tim Morris is here to give you an insight into the pedagogy module. Tim went to see a regatta at Stourport and the next day at age 11 found himself learning to cox a tub pair and the rest as they say is history. Sarah Harris will share her thoughts from professional development. Sarah has been involved for um, a number of years as a, as a high performance competitor, uh, a coach and coach educator, and is currently based at Cotswold Water Park, where she enjoys either being on, in or beside the water, um, and has developed a recent passion to find out more about coach development. And Hannah Vines, um, who you've already met, will delve into the work-based project and independent project. So guys, I'll ask um, you to uh, turn on your cameras and Tim, if you'd like to uh, start. Will, thank you very much. Um, the, the particular module that uh, I'm gonna talk to you about, uh, pedagogy, is it, it's a fancy name really for uh, a, a process of, uh, of developing um, education in, in, in essence. Uh, and the module itself is the link between the theory and some of the practice. Um, and it in, involves developing both ourselves and other coaches to then turn around and develop our athletes, uh, primarily to learn how to solve um, coordination and movement behavioral issues for themselves. So again, we are empowering the athletes to take control uh, of their own individual uh, situation if you like. Um, the module examines uh, many of the things that we take for granted, the stuff that we've got stuck at the back of our head uh, and dragging that forward um, so that we actually um, start to understand why they work and then by applying some of the contemporary academic theories uh, such as a, a thing called constraints-led approach into the context of rowing. Um, the module's much more about improving our understanding by scrutinizing these theories and uh, as I said developing and educating coaches and then linking that thinking to the practical implications of applying these theories to uh, our everyday practice if you like. Um, the, the focus is on, um, on innovative practical and dynamic uh, theoretical learning procedures which approach coaching and coach education from a very different perspective and thereby challenging our traditional thinking uh, again by reflecting back and examining current practice of educating coaches and putting these series into our own coaching situations so we're kind of we're kind of learning for ourselves but we're also learning how to develop other people as well um, if you read the module descriptor, it's a bit of a nightmare, if I'm honest with you. It, it's, it's very wordy, very academic. Um, don't be put off by that. If you plough through uh, some of the terms and, and some of the words that get used, um, you'll develop a much stronger understanding, um, certainly of the theory, 
uh, around the module. Uh, in this particular case, it's it's called uh, ecological dynamics, uh, which is effectively just a framework um, for understanding the events that occur when you mix the interactions between uh, the human performer, the arena that they're performing in, and the activity that, that's being performed. And we learn that by manipulating one or other of these constraints, um, you can affect someone um, or you can allow someone to affect a change in their movement pattern, their coordination, and that will ultimately lead them to, uh, to complete the task more effectively. Um, Ecological dynamics is applied through coaching practice through a process called the constraints led approach, as I said earlier. Uh, and this simply refers to something that we all do on a daily basis anyway. We're just simply applying additional boundaries uh, to the process, to, to the rowing movement pattern. And it offers the performers uh, a series of choices. It's some of them subtle, subtle some of them quite hidden. Uh, where they can affect a behavioural change and, as I said, complete the task more effectively. And an example of that is something like square blade paddling. Uh, that would be a constraint that's applied to normal rowing and it would teach an athlete um, to change their coordination so that they can complete the task more easily. Uh, and, and in the end, my final point really is that as a coach, you'll gain a much deeper appreciation of how to coach and how to coach others to coach. And I think that's quite important in the, the overall picture uh, of, of, what the, uh, uh, of what the level four is, is all about. It's, it's, it's developing other people as well as yourself, uh, not quite at the same time, but in tandem with each other. Um, and that's it. That's, that's my view of that module. Thank you, Tim. Sarah? <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. I probably can understand the module now. You've explained it to me. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I just want to, to cover really personal and professional development in sport. Um, and really, this module covers, uh, well, it introduces you to a variety of leadership theories and practices. And over the course of the module, we certainly explored, experimented with, and reflected upon our own coaching practice. Um, certainly this mod model challenged the perceptions I had of my leadership behaviors and traits. And we also discussed leadership in coaching and, and what makes an effective coach. Um, quite a long debate probably on, on what that is. But the assessment, which I have to say I thoroughly enjoyed, I never ever thought I would, would um, say that in, in the same sentence, enjoyment and assessment, but actually what the assessment did was it led me to create both a personal and professional learning proposal. Um, the questions I have asked my, of myself is how do I become a more effective leader and how do I design a more effective education programme? And I wouldn't have come to that without really going through this, this module. The module gave me really a much needed chance to step back and reflect on my experience, both as a person and also to acknowledge some transitions that I was going through in my personal life. Um, and really then in my professional life, there were also a number of, of transitions particularly around restructures. Um, lots of sports have restructured over the last few years. There's been a lot of funding cuts, a lot of redundancies. So it gave me a chance to really reflect on both what was happening personally and professionally. Um, it gave me the, the tools to really describe what was happening, to acknowledge how it made me feel, to try some new approaches, uh, certainly to explore my strengths and areas for improvement and particularly around asking others for help and feedback. I think it served me really well during this current coronavirus situation because I, I feel like I have a lot more resilience and some leadership tools which I probably wouldn't have had a few years ago and I'd like to think that that's helping myself and the team that I manage to come through this in a better place. Thank you, Sarah. Hannah. Okay, guys. So 
Um, so following on from um, what uh, Tim and Sarah have said, the work-based project is uh, much more um, free in, in, that in, in that respect, in that uh, it takes you back to those days of your, uh, if you've done an undergraduate degree of doing a work-based project uh, and an area of research of your choice. Um, if you've never done an undergraduate dissertation, the idea between of the contact days is to give you some foundation in terms of research methodologies, uh, research skills, identifying which area, um, whether you want to do quantitative or qualitative research. Uh, and I would say the key thing with the work-based project is it, it needs to be something that's very meaningful to you uh, and your work and what you're planning to do. So my work-based project was to look at coaching behaviours. I mean, it's it's the theme, isn't it? Um, but it helped make my research and my findings support my professional development, which is a key aspect that is the the theme of the level four. Um, and uh, you have opportunities. You can. Um, we had some coaches who uh, for the question field looked at burnout. They looked at um, uh, BAM groups who um, took up a question, for example. We had uh, looked at gender differences in rowing. Uh, and it really is quite an open uh, funnel of scope of areas of research that you can do as part of that work-based project. But I would say the key theme there is it's going to enhance your performance as a coach. Uh, and it will be meaningful to you because it will be a big piece of work. Okay, thanks guys. Thank you very much. I hope you found uh, that insightful, a little a little snippet if you like, as, as to what may be uh, to come. The professional practice in sports coaching then is made up of four main modules. Um, the coach pedagogy, personal and professional development, expert coaching context and the work-based project. And as Hannah alluded to, the work-based project is where you can specialise. And this is where, again, the level fourness or the support um, from British Rowing uh, comes in. So whilst the other modules aren't necessarily rowing specific, but more coaching specific, the work-based project allows you to specialise as Hannah said, and this is where we can help. If you've got a particular area of interest, a particular area that you want to develop further, an area of knowledge or expertise or research, this is where we can link you up with specialists within um, our sport um, to help develop that knowledge and help you with um, the research project. So um, again, as Hannah alluded to, there's been a whole range of, of projects there. Um, we've had biomechanics um, and physiology um, work-based projects as well as um, you know more around sort of coaching behaviors so there really is an opportunity there for you to develop your own specialism um, and develop a key area of, of knowledge um, within that within that subject um, this little table here is just to sort of try to reflect that um, it's like a rolling program so each year um, you will share two modules with the year above um, and next year, as, as a year one, you would do expert coach and work-based projects, and then you would move on to coach pedagogy and personal and professional um, development. I've talked a number of times through um, the slides um, about um, handouts and further information. Um, and I also um, mentioned this in the email that you would have had as, as a reminder. Um, so there's an opportunity for you to find out more about the PG DIP um, from Paul Garner and Will Roberts. They're the two uh, characters you can see on the screen. Um, and in the handouts, there'll be a link to a video of, of uh, the two um, discussing some of the concepts that are, are delivered and discussed through the postgraduate diploma. Um, and then there's also a link for you to. Um, join a discussion with them if you wished. Um, so the video is called Talking Heads Video and um, Discussion Opportunity. And as I say, there's a link there to the video itself, but then there's also a link to join a live discussion on Thursday from 9.30 to 10.30, and that will be recorded. So if you can't make that live discussion, I'll make sure there's a way of you being able to, um, to receive that. Um, Within handouts as well, there are the module descriptors, and there's also, as I say, the presentation on level four experience 
um, which includes some quotes from some other level four coaches, as well as a video from one of our level four coaches. You should all be able to see these. Um, again, if you go to your webinar panel that drops down on the right hand side, above the chat um, function, it says handouts three or five. Um, and you should be able to see those three there and you should be able to download them. Um, I'm going to pause for a moment so that you can all try to find that and download them if you can, so that if you're having problems locating those or downloading them, you can pop us a question in the chat and we will try to make sure that we get those passed on to you afterwards if you're unable to see or download them now. Okay, moving on from that, um, I also asked some of the level four coaches um, to recommend some reading. So even if um, the advanced coach program isn't something that you think you want to do either now or you know in the in the future, um, there is some recommended reading that you might find interesting. So uh, number one on our list is nonlinear pedagogy and skill acquisition. Um, and Tim says it's a real page turner. So maybe you might like to have a go at that one. Um, Rachel's go-to while she was on the programme was Sports Coaching, a reference guide for students, coaches and competitors. Um, and she said it was a really useful starting point for most of her assignments as it signposted her to lots of other stuff as well. One of the books that Sarah recommends is a good introduction to a, a variety of leadership theories and how to apply them is Leadership Theory and Practice, the eighth edition. And there's also another book on there for you, The Constraints Led Approach that um, Tim um, spoke about earlier. Um, and there are a number of little video clips that you can find on this Constraints Led Approach, um, which I personally find really interesting. So, um, you know, Google them, um, you'll find them on YouTube. Um, it's quite an interesting concept to, to sort of start um, exploring. So um, in terms of next steps, if the programme is something that you'd be interested in, um, please do uh, get in touch with myself and I can send you further information um, and an application form. Um, and this year we ask that those forms are back by the 10th of July. And then there's an opportunity for us to have a discussion with yourself around um, the programme with key program personnel uh, just to see that you know it's something that you definitely want to do it's the right thing for you uh, whether we can give you any advice on the things uh, to do in the meantime if it's something that you maybe want to um, do at a later date um, as it's a postgraduate diploma there is a cost um, attached to that um, it's a reduced cost um, than it would be if you were studying at the university without coming through um, a sport. Um, it's spread over two years and you can spread that over monthly payments as well. Um, I will say there are lots of opportunities to receive grants and support with that. Um, and if you were fully intended on doing the masters, you could apply for that straight away and apply for a student loan. Um, and if anyone has any questions on that, um, please, please do uh, pop it in the box and we can give you some more specific information. Um, that was what we wanted to cover this evening. So I'd like to personally thank you all for joining us and for listening. I do hope that it fueled, um, fueled some interest in you or at least um, gave you some food for thought around your own coaching practice and behaviours and how you might be able to take a step back, have a look at those and see what you could maybe change to improve that coaching environment and really help ensure that you are enabling your athletes to be the best version of themselves. Um, as a reminder, um, this has been recorded, um, so you will be able to access the recording and slides after the session. Um, and any question and answers um, that that may have come up if we if we don't answer them now um will be available then as well um sarah have there been any questions that we can try and address at this point 
Yes, we do. And I, thank you to everybody that sent in questions. Um, so first question um, really is why would I do the level four and what outcomes do level four coaches typically enjoy? So in terms of outcomes, they uh, are we thinking there in terms of growing performances? I'll answer that as if that is, is how it's uh, how it's intended. And if any of the level four coaches with us want to to add to that, um, if I sort of address that by saying by talking about the, some of the different coaches that have been through the program. So we've had um, two of our current Great Britain Rowing team coaches through the program some coaches from our high performance programs, coaches uh, from junior programs that also uh, coach internationally, um, as well as coaches um, that are that working within university programs and participation programs. Um, so you can see we've had a widespread of coaches attending, um, all with the same aim that they want to uh, enable their athletes to perform better at whatever level that may be and um, to develop them as people um, and I think it's from from my perspective it's been really interesting to see their journeys through the program um, and to see the coaches that they were at the beginning and, and how they have developed um, and come out the other end um, whether you can correlate that directly to rowing performance um, is probably subjective but um, I certainly see the um, changes and um, the development that they've had and the environments that they create and the passion and the inspiration they give to their athletes. Um, you know, and one of the coaches said at the start of their programme, they wanted to do the qualification for a certificate to move on to a high performance job. And actually, by the end of the qualification, realised that um, whilst that might still be a name at some point down the line, actually, the biggest impact of this programme was um, the biggest impact that it had on their coach, on their athletes, that their athletes wanted to come back, not because they had to, but because they enjoyed being there. Um, there have been a number of coaches that have obviously presented <clears throat> athletes that have moved forward and um, been able to generate a performance and generate medals at key events um, and there have been uh, coaches that have come and talked about athletes that started rowing because they had no hope in anything else um, either through um, a special need or an illness um, or through lack of self-esteem and actually have come out and themselves have become coaches or have become um, captains of the clubs and have gone on to take on really important roles um, in their careers. Um, and that's definitely as a result of rowing. Um, one of the coaches that has joined us this evening um, heard recently from a parent, they coach um, three of her children um, and what was unbeknownst to the coach was that they'd lost um, their parent and how much rowing had actually given to those athletes. And we all, we all know this, I'm sure, because it's the sport we're passionate about. We know how much power it has. Um, but yeah, there's definitely been some, some tangible um, results as a, as a result of, of people attending the course. I don't know whether anyone else wants to chip in on that. We've had a, another question come through, Loretta, which is really around, um, could we share what, typ what typical commitment we, you'd need to make over the two year period? I guess that might be something that um, one of you guys might like to pick up on having, having actually been through the programme. But in terms of contact days, um, there are three blocks typically within the year. So October, February and March with assignments that are aligned to the different modules. Um, as I said, it may look slightly different moving forward, but the first block is normally three days in October, which includes an induction and then two days of face-to-face -face discussions and uh, delivery, excuse me. And then there's another two days in February and another two days in March. And a couple of individual days. In terms of time 
to apply your, your sort of knowledge and your skills to your assignments. That's obviously something I um, haven't quantified, um, but the level four experience handout talks a bit about that. Um, I don't know whether um, either Tim, Sarah or, or Hannah want to, to add to that. Um, yeah, I think um, it's not necessarily something that you have to attend to every single day. There is a significant amount of, of reading and interpreting that reading to be done. Um, so certainly regular um, reference back to the work is, is helpful, certainly for me. I, I've got a shocking memory. I tend to forget things quite easily. And uh, regular reference sort of keeps it in my mind. Um, I think once you get into it, you probably never stop thinking about it. But, you know, that's down to an individual thing, isn't it? Um, if you wanted to figure on how much time each week, um, I have the benefit of not uh, not working, I'm retired now. I would imagine I probably spend maybe 10 hours, 12 hours a week actually physically doing something towards the award. I think. Sarah, Anna, do you have anything else to add? Uh, no. Uh, the only thing I would add is is when you get to the work based, uh, or in a sense, essentially with any of the themes of the modules, is uh, is quite simply just don't underestimate it. I mean, how many times if you're working with junior athletes, do you see them start to panic when coursework reaches a deadline? Um, no offence, but the three of us are all looking at each other, going, "Yeah, we've all done it." Um, <laughs> And it is it is about kind of almost allocating a golden hour in your week to where you will um, adopt some time to kind of look at what they're asking to do because when you it, when you put it off and you try and do it two weeks before a deadline, um, you will disengage from the program. That's my own experience. Is I wasn't organised enough, um, didn't stay on top of the the reading particularly, and 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 if you're not familiar with some of the language and the terms, then. Yeah. That will trip you up and cause you some frustration and so yeah. it's giving yourself time to read that and as tim said reflect on it mull it over think about its theoretical applications and i think once you get over those hurdles and those barriers and there will be a few to start with you'll you'll go and you will really in, engage with it and um, because you own the subject and you own your program and the way you apply it that's the beauty of it it isn't write me 3,000 words on something that's alien to you. It's about writing about your own practice and that's where you go on that journey. Yeah, yeah I agree with that. Um, Loretta, I'm conscious of the time. We've had we've had a number of other um, questions that have come through. Some are very specific to Hannah's programme, um, which I think we won't have time to answer now, but I know that um, Hannah has very generously agreed to answer some questions, which will all be up on the on the website following this. So again, thank you to everybody that sent questions in. We will um, we will answer all of them, including those. There's been a few coaches that have asked for some specific information um, related to their situation. So I think um, in the in fairness to everybody, um, it might be better if we take those offline and uh, Loretta, Hannah, and Tim will answer questions going forwards. Absolutely. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I would just like to um, say another thank you to the three of you for joining us um, and for giving up your time on a Tuesday evening. Um, thank you again for joining us, those of you out there. It's nice to virtually see you and feel connected. Um, you'll shortly receive a request for feedback on the webinar. Um, it's really important for us to help us shape the future of these webinars. Um, you know, it's been something obviously that we've brought on board in these times, but we're hoping to continue as best as we can once we're, we're through it all and back on the water. Um, the next session is on Thursday and it's a webinar with Ben Sneath about um, strength training and how you can maintain that within this current environment. So thank you once again, everyone, and um, good night from me and good night from them, as it were. Good, good night. night. night